What is going on guys, Armand here. Welcome back to the channel. So I've been shooting with the A7R5 for a couple months now, since early December when the camera launched. And I really wanted to fully test out the camera and put it through its paces before I made a review on it. Now I was able to shoot with the camera in a bunch of different environments, like studio portraits, landscapes. I got to test the weather ceiling, a whole bunch of different things and I do have some opinions on it. So let's just get right into it. And the first one is of course, image quality. So the A7R5 has the exact same 61 megapixel sensor as the A7R4. The only difference is the deep learning AI autofocus chip. If you've ever used the A7R4, the image quality is literally the same on the R5. The only noticeable difference I would say is maybe the ISO performance is a little bit better, but I think in most real world scenarios, the image quality is exactly the same. Nothing's changed. The resolution is the same. So if you're shooting with an R4 and you're thinking maybe should I upgrade to the R5, I would say wait till the end of the video and I can give my opinion on that. So the first test I did was the ISO performance and honestly the ISO performance is great especially for a camera with that big of a sensor. I did notice that between ISO 100 and ISO 4000, the noise performance wasn't really that bad. After 4000 is when I noticed it start to creep in a little bit, but even up to 20,000 ISO, honestly, the photos were still usable and they looked really good. All the pictures and the example are just raw, straight out of camera, directly converted to JPEG. But I did put a look on one of them at 20,000 ISO just to kind of give some reference point. You do notice some of the sensor patterns on the graded photo, but that image is without any noise reduction or anything like that. So use that maybe as a reference point for the usability of high ISO images. And honestly, the, the R4 sensor is the same as the R5 sensor and the image looks amazing. There's a ton of dynamic range. I've shot with it in a bunch of different situations. I don't think you'll have any issues getting a fantastic image out of the sensor. Okay, so some of the biggest upgrades on this camera is the video performance. And actually the last few videos I've done in this video, I've shot all on the A7R5. I don't have the A7S III anymore. This is the camera I sold the A7S III for. And honestly, it looks great. No complaints. I did do some high ISO tests and really what I noticed was the ISO performance depends on the lighting situation. So I did one in a well-lit forest, it looks pretty good. I did one by a dark waterfall when the sun was starting to go down and the image was like borderline unusable. <laughs> uh, another thing I noticed was S-Log3 versus neutral. Because S-Log3 does push for the extra stops of dynamic range, it is noisier. So if you do want to shoot in a lower light situation, I would probably recommend against shooting S-Log3. I would really only save S-Log3 if you can shoot in a lower ISO setting because it just generally is a noisier profile even though it does look really good. But obviously low ISOs just like this video, I'm shooting on ISO 100 and other kind of like cinematic videos I've shot at low ISOs. They look fantastic, no issues, tons of dynamic range, although not as much no dynamic range as the A1 or the A7S 3 It's still enough to produce a really awesome image, honestly. So for some of the video specs and the crop factors, at 4K24, there's no crop factor. It's the full sensor readout. It's super sharp, it looks great. And then if you go to 4K60, there's a 1.25 times crop. And then if you turn on focus breathing, you can add an additional 1.25 times crop. So with focus breathing, compensation on, on 4K24 is 1.25, and then at 4K60, with it on is 1.5 times crop. So essentially your 24 millimeter would be a 30 millimeter or with the 1.5 times crop, it's 36 millimeters. So another cool video feature that was introduced with the a7 IV is the video focus map. It's kind of an alternative to focus peaking, which personally I like the new video focus map a little more than focus peaking because all focus peaking does is just draw the line on the outside of whatever's in focus 
and the video focus map, map is like big chunky blocks <laughs> uh, which might be a little bit easier to see and then whatever's in focus is just you know not outlined at all you know it's subjective whatever your personal preference is but I think either you know can work pretty well one thing that's not so great about this camera is the rolling shutter there's no real way to focus that other than don't do huge panning movements. It's definitely more noticeable at 4K 60 how bad the rolling shutter is. Probably the biggest downside of the video specs in this camera. But obviously, you know, if you're on a tripod like this, you know, it it's fine. I don't really need to cover the 8K video too much because I don't really think we're at that point where 8K video matters, but it looks great. It's fine. Uh, there's a 1.2 times crop if you do need to use 8K. Honestly, I think the only real world scenario where 8k is useful is if you need to crop or if you're doing vfx of some kind but i don't think anybody is purposely shooting youtube videos in 8k or you know instagram videos in 8k or anything like that so to add on to the previous video features it does do 16-bit external prores raw and i did test it out with the atomos ninja v and personally I don't really like the look of it. It's super noisy and you can only edit the files in Final Cut or Premiere. Adobe doesn't have support for that yet. So you have to actually edit the files and then bring it into DaVinci as a non-RAW file. And even then ProRes RAW, like its RAW features are still pretty limited. So personally, I don't think that's something I will be using with this camera or even my a1 it's just extra things to add to the workflow that don't really add that much extra range maybe if you're in a well-lit scene even though the base iso is like 800 and it's pushing for the extra stops of dynamic range and stuff like that in my opinion it's just a waste for me it's cool to have that feature maybe it'll get updated in the future and it'll be usable, but not something I personally use. For the cards, it uses the Sony CF Express Type A cards. You know, nothing new, they're fast, they work great, they're tough cards, they're shockproof, waterproof, all that stuff. I have a bunch of them and I've been using them since the A7S III came out a couple years ago and I really like them. It has two card slots and the card slots are also usable with regular SD cards. So the port in there is interchangeable. So you can put regular SD cards or CF Express type A cards. So you can use either one. Personally, if you're gonna spend this much money on a camera, just get the fastest card. And currently to my knowledge, all of the video modes do work with the V90 SD card. But if you do want the faster transfer speeds, go for the CF Express Type A cards. And plus I think you're future proofing yourself if you get the CF Express Type A cards because all the future Sony cameras are just probably going to have them anyways. That's what I'm guessing. That's what they've been going with. So personally, that's the card I would buy. Okay, so the big shiny new feature with this camera that Sony introduced is the deep learning AI autofocus. So from my testing with it is the autofocus is really, really good. It really keeps the subject tracked and locked for long periods of time. It never loses. And the cool thing about the AI autofocus is that not only does it track eyes, it tracks objects, insects, cars, you know, literally everything you can imagine. But the A7R5 is a really slow camera. <laughs> So there's almost, I don't wanna say there's almost no point of having it, but the keeper rate on burst mode is about 50%, I would say. So only half your images are gonna stay in focus and that's because it doesn't have a stacked sensor like the A1 or the A9 cameras. It just has the regular backside illuminated sensor and it has blackouts in between shooting. So it's kind of a slow camera. It just can't really keep up with what the AI autofocus can really produce. This technology is obviously coming to the next line of Sony cameras like the A1 Mark II. I'm just assuming here, I don't have any insider knowledge. Really cool use, but I don't know how practical it is for a camera like this. It's definitely not a sports camera. It's more of a, more of a slower use kind of camera in my opinion. But overall, autofocus, fantastic, super accurate, tracks the subjects well. It's just burst mode can't really keep up with the focus 
is the big issue here. Another new thing that Sony gave us with this camera, and it's honestly my favorite part, is the flip screen. I think they're calling it a four axis tilt screen. It tilts, it flips, it does everything. You can literally use the camera at any angle. It's amazing. The screen is also 0.2 inches bigger than the A1 and the previous Sony screens, which I like. So overall, probably one of my favorite features of the new camera. At first I was a little hesitant if I was gonna like it or not because I thought like maybe it's flimsy, maybe it'll break, I don't know, but been using the tilt screens for years now. There's no problem with it. You're gonna love it if you buy the camera. And another new feature, and honestly, it's one of the main reasons I bought the camera is the built-in focus stacking. So the way it works is you can choose how many photos you want the camera to take and how narrow or wide the focus distance is. None of the Sony cameras have witness marks on any of the lenses. So you can't really see like when you're you're focusing on the barrel like how far incrementally the range is on the focus distance but basically if you choose a narrower focus distance range it'll take more photos and less incrementally but if you choose a, a wider range it'll focus in wider ranges you know kind of self-explanatory for the test I did I just chose 40 photos, but it actually ended up producing only 29 photos. And originally Sony said you need to use their own proprietary software to put the image together, but that's actually not true. You can just do it in Lightroom and Photoshop. It's super easy to do. Import the photos into Lightroom, edit them however you want. They all have to be the same. And then just open them as a layer in Photoshop and then auto align and then auto blend and you should have fully focused stacked image. I made a little mistake on mine and that should be a lesson for you guys uh, with focus stacking is you have to focus on the nearest subject to you, then it'll go from there. And I think a way of fixing that is to pick a narrower range of more photos and incrementally, I think that will ultimately help out. And of course, shoot more stop down like F11, F13, something like that. But overall, I love the focus stacking feature. Haven't been able to use it in a real world, like practical setting yet but I think this is gonna be really good for, of course, landscape photographers, that's what I am, uh, product photographers, things of that nature, maybe even architecture, but yeah, overall, really great feature, and I'm glad Sony finally introduced it. So another new addition is the mode dial on top of the camera that replaced the old exposure compensation dial. And I think this is a welcome change. Uh, it is customizable. And one cool thing is that you can make it so if you're in manual mode, you can customize it to whatever you want. Then if you're in shutter speed or aperture priority, it'll switch over to exposure compensation. The, the dial really has multiple uses, which I think is cool. I'm glad Sony made that change. If you just shoot in manual mode all the time, the focus comp wheel doesn't even do anything, so. Okay, the weather sealing on this camera works great. I've had it by a bunch of waterfalls. I've had it out in the rain. Haven't had it in the dust yet, but Sony does say it is dust and moisture resistant, so I wouldn't dump it in the ocean or try to, you know, take it underwater for a swim. Definitely do not do that. Uh, but I do think some light rain or mist is totally gonna be fine. I've had all my Sony cameras out in the rain before and never had any problems with it. Uh, if you do get salt water on your camera though, definitely wash that off with distilled water, drinking water, whatever kind of water you got that's not salt water, just wash it off because it will actually corrode your camera. Okay, so the in-body image stabilization in this camera was another big hype feature and the maximum stops of stabilization you can get is eight full stops. That's what Sony is claiming. I do have to say it is really good and I have seen a lot of examples where people are using it and it almost looks like you're on a gimbal, which I think is pretty sweet. Uh, you can use the Sony Catalyst browse software with this. If you use the active stabilization, I think, uh, the active stabilization does crop in a little bit. But for everything I've been doing, I've just been using the standard stabilization and I just stabilize it in DaVinci and it looks great. No issues. There's no 
weird sensor wobble or anything like that. Haven't really ever needed to use the Sony Catalyst software yet, but it's definitely there if you need to. Okay, so pricing on this camera. In the US, it's going for about 3,900. So that kind of puts it in the middle with the A1 at 6,500, the R5 at 3,900. They do sell the A7 R4 still, and then the A7 IV at 2400. I think the price is pretty good for the amount of camera you're getting. For $700 more over the A7 IV, you're getting so many more features. You're getting the AI autofocus. You're getting the better screen. The viewfinder looks fantastic. You're getting the new mode dial. You're getting way better video features. That $700 actually goes a really long way. If you can pick up a used a7 IV, probably going for around 2000 right now, which is still a fantastic camera, super usable images. And I actually used that camera for a good two years before I upgraded to my A1. And I think if it's a camera that you're gonna keep for a really long time, and I think the R5 is a really fantastic body. Okay, so who is this camera for? So I think landscape photographers, commercial, portrait, product, maybe even wedding photographers. The only thing I would say is if you're gonna shoot a wedding with this is on a single 160 gig CF Express Type A card, you get about 1150 photos uncompressed. You're shooting a whole wedding day. You're probably gonna run through about three, maybe more cards, probably a little bit over that. 500 gig range in data. I would definitely not recommend this camera if you need to shoot anything that's fast moving like wildlife, sports, automotive, anything like that where you have to track your subject and you really need that sensor to perform and the speed of it. That's more so for like the A1 or any of the A9 bodies. It's more of a slower working camera. Obviously it's not medium format or anything like that, but it is a big sensor and it is for it is a body where you do need to take your time when you're using it. Okay, so closing thoughts on the camera. Was it worth swapping out the A7S3 for? Absolutely yes, 100%. I loved my A7S3. I, I got a ton of use out of it, but I needed a second photo body that could also do video and have the flip out screen and all that. And this camera just fits the bill perfectly. I do think all the new upgraded features I'm definitely gonna take advantage of. And I do think for myself personally, I wanna stick with this camera for at least five years because there aren't really a lot of other features that I need to use other than maybe if they were to include like raw video like in the body that would be pretty cool but I don't see that coming anytime soon it would be on the a7s line not the a7r line at least not yet the images look fantastic it's a really really good second body to my a1 so if you already have an A1 and you want to pick up a cheaper second camera, I think this is almost like an A1 mini because the resolution is a little bit more than the A1. The images it produces is fantastic. It has a ton of dynamic range. The color science looks great. There isn't really a lot of drawbacks to this camera for me other than 4K 120 frames 10 bit. That's one big feature that the A1 has over this one. The reason I picked this camera over the a7 IV is the resolution. I do landscape photography and product photography mostly, so I do need the extra resolution, uh, especially for compositing. That helps me out quite a bit. The cool new flip out screen, the focus bracketing. There's honestly so much tech and so many new features in this camera. It's like, it's kind of mind blowing how much they packed in there. It's it's actually kind of hard to review every single feature the camera has because there's just so many now. Overall, I think Sony did really good with this one, 10 out of 10. My personal opinion, let me know what you guys think if you want to pick up one or if you're going to pick up one. I have affiliate links in the description below. If you want to pick up a camera or any of the gear I use, definitely check that out. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe if you're not, like the video, and I will see you guys guys very soon.